Well, if you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does that you can look on with, let me invite you to open with me to Psalm chapter 127. Psalm chapter 127, just kind of open the Bible to the middle, and you'll likely be around Psalms, and uh, then go to chapter 127. And uh, I have a lot to share today. Uh, one, this text is so good. There is so much here in this short psalm that applies to our everyday lives that we need to hear. And then I want to share something very personal with you that my family and I have been walking through over the last six months, and really longer than that, that relatively few people know about. I uh, shared a little bit, very vaguely, at one point here at Tyson's, but as I think about others at other locations, which we're glad to be together around God's Word with, and Loudon and Prince William, and MoCo, as well as others online, that I've not shared. And it's by far uh, been the most pressing and heavy thing on my heart over the last six months and beyond. But I want to share that, I hope, in a way that will encourage you amidst a variety of things that may be pressing or heavy on your heart today. And then I want to encourage you with what God is doing in and through you, us, as a church family. So if you were to kind of think in three sections, just hearing straight from God in the text, I want to share something personally with you, and then I want to encourage us, the church family. So let's dive right in. Psalm 127, verse 1. This is the Word of God. And on that note, isn't, isn't it good this summer to hear God's Word from different pastors and be reminded that it's God's Word, not any person or any pastor that brings us together? As long as God's Word is proclaimed, we are a happy people. So let's hear the Word of God to us today. Psalm 127, verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Oh God, please speak by your spirit through this word to every person listening right now and to anyone who might listen to this in the future. In Jesus' name, amen. This is quite a text. They really splits up into two parts, though how they're connected is so important. Let's start with the first part, verses 1 and 2. Did you notice the word or the phrase that's repeated three times? May circle it in your Bible. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor what? In vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake. In vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest. So in the original language of the Old Testament, this word literally means empty, like meaningless, pointless. Like you can build a house... But in the end, if you do it apart from the Lord, you'll miss the whole point. Amen. You can try to watch over a city, but apart from the Lord and his help, your watching will be wasted. No matter how early you get up or late you go to bed, you will live in anxious toil. So here's how I'd summarize it using the language coming from this psalm. Psalm 127 is giving us a picture here of the vain, pointless, anxious, wasted life. 
At which point I would just pause and ask, who of us wants that kind of life? Who of us wants to go through life anxious only to get to the end and realize it was all in vain, in vain, in vain. It was wasted. I totally missed the point. I, I don't think anybody wants this life, so let's hear God speaking to us because here's what leads to this kind of life. So two things, let me show them to you. Write these down. If you do these two things, this is the kind of life you will have. One, the vain, pointless, anxious, wasted life works without dependence on God. It works. It builds. It watches. Even rises up early and goes late to rest. But it does all these things saying, I don't need the Lord. I don't need God. I can build watch and work on my own. And then second, the vain, pointless, anxious, wasted life toils without trust in God. So this word for toil here is the same word that's translated pain back in Genesis chapter 3 verse 16 when we see the initial curse of sin. The picture is you work hard you do all that you can to build and watch, to work, to provide. You're toiling like it all depends on you to fix this, to solve that, to control this, to make that happen. It's all in your hands, which inevitably leads to anxiety when you can't fix it or you can't solve it, you can't control it, you can't make it happen. Now, it's at this point, I just want us to pause and realize, this is how all of us are prone to live. From the youngest to the oldest among us, we are all prone to work without dependence on God, to get up and go about our day. We have so much to do, school, work, this or that with kids or family, this or that with friends, this or that in our schedules. And any one of us can dive into all of those things without stopping to spend concentrated time with God saying, I can't do any of these things apart from you. And any of us can easily go throughout our days without sitting down, opening up God's word and saying, I need you. I need to hear from you. I need help from you without setting aside half an hour, an hour, or more to express our dependence on God, we are far too busy a people for that. Now, I realize some people might be here today and you don't yet believe in God. Maybe you're exploring Christianity or maybe you're visiting with a friend or family member. Maybe you're atheist or agnostic and you might say, I don't need the help of God or love of God. I can do all these things on my own. After all, I've built my career with hard work. I worked hard in school. I worked hard to climb the ladder. I got up early. I get up early. I'm successful. It seems to work for me. At which point I would say, based on the authority of what God is saying, I'm sure you do. I'm sure you work hard. I'm sure you get up early and you have earned and are earning what you work for. But I would just ask the follow-up question. Who gives you breath to get up early? Who gave you a mind to study in school? Who's given you the ability to climb that ladder? Who's causing your heart to beat or your lungs to breathe right now? The Bible is telling you today that the success that you enjoy actually comes from the God that you deny, which makes his love for you all the greater. Absolutely, you can be an atheistic home builder. There are many atheistic home and company and country builders in the world. But in the end, it will be pointless. That's what God is saying right now. Apart from dependence on me, you work in vain. 
Now, for most in a setting like this, in church, you're not an atheist. You believe in God and Jesus. But I would submit that many Christians live like practical atheists. If you are a Christian, but you get up and go on with your day without stopping to spend concentrated time to express your need and desire for God and his help, aren't you living practically like it's all dependent on you? What's the practical difference between you and an atheist when your schedules look pretty much the same? Many Christians live like they don't need God every single day. And this practical atheism is all the more prevalent when we get to the second part of the picture here, toiling without trust in God. How many of us, even as children of God, are tempted to toil without trust in God? How many of us can easily lay in bed at night worrying about this, going through our days anxious about that, as if God is not in control? Or as if he is not worthy of our trust? We are anxious people. Teenagers anxious about what others think about them, about grades, about getting into schools. We're anxious about getting jobs, anxious about our careers, our investments, our health, our families, our friends. If we're not careful, we can be just like a godless world around us, toiling without trust in the God who saves us from that kind of life. How many of us, when faced with a problem, instinctively turn to ourselves and think, okay, how can I fix this? Instead of immediately turning to God and saying, I need you to fix this. How many of us, when we face a problem, instinctively or immediately resort to fasting and praying for that problem? Now, at this point, some might say, well, let's be real. You can't just sit back and do nothing. You can't just pray. At some point, you have to work and do something. But that's exactly what the psalm is saying. The psalm is not saying it's wrong to build or watch or get up early or go late to rest. We can actually go all over the Bible to see that it's good and wise and biblical to build and watch, even to get up early and stay up late sometimes. But notice the difference. So here's the contrast between the vain, pointless, anxious, wasted life. Now let's see the opposite. The valuable, meaningful, peace-filled life that counts. The kind of life that does the exact opposite of what we just saw. Instead of working without dependence on God, this kind of life works in constant dependence on God. It builds with the realization that apart from God's help, apart from the Lord building, whatever is built won't matter. It won't last. The kind of life that, yes, watches, stays awake with the realization you're not the only one watching. The Lord is watching. And you need his help to watch well. You watch in dependence on the Lord watching. You build in dependence on the Lord building. I I wish we had time to turn here today, but just maybe write it down. Genesis 11 is a perfect illustration of this. That chapter starts with all these people building a tower, the Tower of Babel, not in dependence on God, but in defiance of God. And all of them, with all their ingenuity, build this tower, and in a second, God stops it, and they're scattered. They can't even speak to each other anymore. All their building, just like that, is shown to be vain, pointless, and wasted in an instant. But then in the second half of that chapter, God calls one guy named Terah. And God says, I'm going to build you a family. I'm going to give you a son. His name is going to be Abraham. And through him, I'm going to build an entire nation, an entire movement that will one day reach all the nations. And church, you and I are sitting here today in Metro Washington, D.C., thousands of years later as part of the building God began that day. That's valuable, meaningful life that counts because it builds in dependence on God. You want to work, build, watch wisely in this world? 
Hear this. You and I can accomplish more in 10 minutes in dependence on God than we can in a lifetime of dependence on ourselves. If you believe that, it will change the way you live. Our lives would look very different if we believed that, that the Lord builds and we build in dependence on him, which is why this kind of life gets up in the morning and gets on your face and says, I can't do anything apart from you, God opens up his word and says, I need to hear from you. And I need to ask for your help in all these ways. And you start walking through your day. God, I need your help in this and this and this to come. And not just now, I'm going to ask for your help all day long. My eyes are going to be totally fixed on you because there's nothing I'm going to face today that I can do on my own. I need, I desire you and your help. Does that describe your life? Yes. This is the kind of life that counts. And then don't miss where this kind of life leads. Not to anxious toil. No, for those who depend on God, he gives his beloved sleep. Ah, see it. The valuable, meaningful, peace-filled life that counts, works in constant dependence on God, and rests with complete trust in God. Isn't this so good? There's a way to work, to build, to watch that leads to rest. Like there's a way to be a teenager and not be stressed. There's a way to be an adult and not worry about this or that. Because you realize that as you build and as you watch, as you work in dependence on God, you are loved by God. Amen. That's that's who you are. You're beloved. Are you hearing this word? Are you seeing this in the text? This is God describing all who trust in him. You are beloved by the builder of the universe and the watcher over the whole world. He loves you so much he sent his son to die on a cross for you so that you might rest in him for all of eternity. And if you can rest in him for the next 10 trillion years, you can rest in him for today and tomorrow and the next and the next. Which means you can lay your head on your pillow at night no matter what is happening around you, no matter how many problems are swirling, how many burdens you are bearing, and you can close your eyes and you can go to sleep because yeah. you know that ultimately you and all these problems and all these burdens are in the hands of the Lord. Amen. And he loves you. And by the way, he never goes to sleep. In other words, he never stops working for you. I'm pretty sure I've shared this before, but one of my favorite quotes on sleep is from John Piper. He writes, sleep is a daily reminder from God that we are not God. Once a day, God sends us to bed like patients with a sickness. The sickness is a chronic tendency to think that we're in control and that our work is indispensable. To cure us of this disease, God turns us into helpless sacks of sand once a day. How humiliating to the self-made corporate executive that he or she has to give up all control and become as limp as a suckling infant every day. He calls sleep the broken record that comes around with the same message every day that we are not in control, that God alone is the great worker who never tires and never sleeps, and God is not nearly as impressed with our late nights and early mornings as he is with the peaceful trust that casts all our anxieties on him and goes to sleep. Now, what's interesting is where this psalm goes next, because we could really just stop here. I mean, those two verses, there's so much to soak in here. But in verse 3, this psalm takes what almost seems like a left turn and starts about talking about children. But I would submit this is no left turn for so many reasons. One, when the Bible talks about building a house, it's often talking about building a family. When you look at 2 Samuel chapter 7, 
When God promised to build King David a house, God was talking about building a family for him. And that in and of itself is instructive for us, isn't it? Because when we think about building, we often think about building a career or a business or a portfolio or a resume. But the Bible actually prioritizes building a family with children and lots of them at that. A quiver full of them. That's a very different perspective than the world around us today. We live in a world that sees children as a barrier to our careers and all that we want to accomplish. The trend lines are clear. Young adults in our culture putting off marriage until later and later, oftentimes in the name of getting an education, a job, building a career, as if marriage is a barrier to that. And kids, an even larger barrier, even a burden that would prevent that. Do you see what's wrong with this picture that we're buying into? We live in a culture that sees children as barriers and burdens when the Bible calls them blessings. So let's be careful with the way we talk about children, even as the church. We say, I have one kid or two kids or three kids, and I, I don't want any more. Is that the way we talk about blessings? Or is that the way we talk about burdens? Singles, and especially men who have the responsibility of leading a home. If God has called you to be single, then by all means, maximize singleness for his glory. But if not, then pursue a wife, not years from now, but now. Independence on God, and when you get married, and for all who are married, unless God clearly says otherwise, pursue and prize children, trusting that in some cases, in his wisdom, he doesn't provide children in the way we might hope, but knowing that we should not see kids as barriers or burdens to be avoided, but as blessings to be sought from the Lord. And I should add here how thankful I am for singles and parents across this church family who are giving their lives to pour into the next generation of children in our church family. Over the last couple weeks, I was at Rock Senior High Camp and it was just a junior high camp, and I saw faithful men and women, some of them spending their vacation days, riding hours on a bus, sleeping on a very uncomfortable bunk in, at least in the guys' cabins, some rank rooms where every teenage boy forgot their deodorant or refuses to wear what they brought with them. (laughs) And there are men and women in these cabins studying the Bible and praying with these students because they believe every single one of them is a gift from the Lord. And I should also add, I am praying for a culture in our church where we do not have to beg for Rock and Kids Quest volunteers like serving the next generation is a burden for someone to endure. I am praying for a culture of church members who see serving the next generation as a blessing that we are pursuing. Knowing that, yes, children and students, with all due respect to my own, are not always easy. A couple of Sundays ago, I was visiting different Kids Quest rooms here at Tyson's just to thank different people for serving. And there were a couple of those rooms where, man, that was, it was not just quiverful, that was hands full. And I felt really bad for days when sermons go long in here and apologized to them for that. And we all know this. What parent in this room would say that raising toddlers or teenagers is a breeze? But isn't that the beauty of this psalm? Apply what we've seen in this psalm to parenting. How do you parent in a way that's valuable and meaningful and peace-filled, in a way that counts? You parent in constant dependence on God. God, I can't do this without you. God, I need your wisdom, I need your strength, I need your help. I'm building here as best as I can with 
what you've given to me, but I can't do anything apart from your building. Don't try to parent apart from dependence on God. Like, parent, what other reason do you need to come before God for half an hour, hour, however long in the morning to hear from him, to be with him, and to ask him for help on behalf of the kids he's entrusted to your care? And as you constantly depend on God, here's the good news. You can rest with trust in God. I could not sleep at night if I thought parenting was totally up to me. The only way I can sleep at night is knowing that God loves my kids more than I do and that God loves me and that he promises me when I wake up in the morning that I'm going to have new mercy waiting for whatever parenting brings that day. So to every mom or dad within the sound of my voice, of all ages with any kids, including young children to adult children, Hear the Lord saying to you right now in all of your efforts to build your house, your children, your family, hear the Lord saying to you right now, I love you. Keep depending on me and trusting in me. That's a word from God. And I would add as a significant side note, for those who are listening who desire children. But God is not answering in the way you are asking and desiring. Whether you're single or married, I think of a faithful brother and sister in our church family who just spent the last two months in children's hospital fighting for their little boy's life who was born two months ago. And this week, their little boy went to be with the Lord. So for them, for anyone who's walked that kind of road, anyone who's experiencing sorrow or struggle in the desire to be a parent, hear God saying to you right now through his word, I love you. You are beloved. Keep depending on me. And rest in my love. For you, and thinking that, circumstance, think about that circumstance specifically, to rest in his love for this child who died all too soon, knowing the Bible teaches that child is beloved by God and is safe in his arms forever. Which actually leads to how this psalm turns all of this around. Did you notice this? So here's children. They're a heritage from the Lord. They're a reward. They're like arrows. They're a blessing, to have a quiver full of them who stand with you when you face your enemies in the gate. So here's the picture here. Here's a here's parent right here. And then here's enemies. Uh, we'll just, here's enemies. They're coming at the parent at the gate. And this parent, if this parent's alone, is like, oh, no. Enemies stand here by myself, but not this parent, because this parent has a quiver full of arrows who are right there with him. And when they start to mess, these guys start to mess with this guy, he's like, well, it's not just me. It's me and my crew. <laughs> Do you see this? Like this, this crew that's like ready to fight for their parent? In God's design, parents watch out for children in a way that one day children watch out for parents. Amen. And this, this, is, this is a good word for all who are caring for aging parents right now. Hear God saying to you, what you're doing is good work. It's good for your mom, your dad to have you behind them with them as they face whatever challenges are coming their way. You are a reward for your parents. And that's not always easy, but God will give you and your parent everything you need to be a blessing to them as you trust in him. Amen. Let me tell you how I saw that illustrated over the last couple of weeks. 
many of you know, and Mike mentioned Levon, one of our pastors here at Tyson's, who had fought with a brain tumor for 10 years. A couple of months ago, he and his family realized there wasn't anything else that could be done to stop its growth. I want to tell you what I saw when I went to Lee's home. I saw a man lying in bed facing what 1 Corinthians 15 calls the last enemy, death itself. And do you know what I saw around him? I saw this picture. I saw his wife, his grown kids. They were taking care of him, giving him his medicines and helping him be comfortable. And they were reading the Bible, speaking God's word into him every single day. Years ago, when his kids were young, Lee read the Chronicles of Narnia to them. Over the last month, they decided to pick it back up and read it to him, specifically the last battle where C.S. Lewis imagines resurrection and new creation to come. I give you a picture in Lee Vaughn of building a family in dependence on God, seeing children as a blessing from God, and one day finding yourself with them at your back as you walk through heaven's gate. Is this not a great psalm? So let me share with you how God has specifically used this psalm in my life and family. Many of you know the story of my family I've shared before, if you've been around NBC, how Heather and I struggled, agonized through years of infertility, desiring to build a home, but God not blessing in the way we desired. And how the Lord used that journey to open our eyes to adoption. And we adopted our first son, Caleb, from Kazakhstan. After which Heather, to our complete surprise, became pregnant with our second son, Joshua. That led to a failed adoption process in Nepal, where we redirected to China, adopted our daughter, Mara, from there. After which, Heather again, to our surprise, became pregnant with Isaiah. And at that point, we said we were joyfully content. To be perfectly vulnerable, I think I saw additional children as too much, as preventing us from doing things we would like to do. Until a date night, years later, when the subject of adoption came up at dinner in a way we had not planned, and the only way I can describe it is God met us at the table that night. By the time we paid the check, we were ready to start the process again. So we did, again from China, and we were matched with a son, three and a half at the time, named JD. And many of you know, we were three days away from going to pick him up in January 2020 when we received word that China was closing because of a virus. And the initial word was that it would be open again soon. And that began a process of waiting for now two and a half years, not knowing when we can bring our son home. So I've shared all of that before in the church. What I haven't shared is what happened next. A few months later, we were in the Psalms in our church Bible reading plan, much like we are right now, and on the day we came to Psalm 127, I read this Psalm. And as I meditated and prayed about how children are a blessing, specifically a quiver full of children is a blessing, I began to think, why would we not want more blessings? If I believe that, then why? Would I not want more blessing? And the more I asked that question in prayer, the more I began to sense maybe our quiver is not full, even with adding JD to our family. So I wrote all that down in my journal, but obviously needed to talk with Heather about this. And as we began to talk, we realized, well, both of us were reading the same psalm, and both of us were thinking the same thing. Thus began a journey where it became clear that the chances of having another child biologically were small, but adoption was definitely a possibility. So after praying and exploring, we began a parallel adoption process domestically here in the U.S. through Lifeline, a great gospel-centered ministry that, among other things, works with birth moms and dads when possible who desire to put together an adoption plan. 
Well, fast forward to the end of last year, December, when Heather and I received the notice that a birth mom was set to deliver in about a month, and she desired a home for her baby girl. And in the notice we received, we heard that this birth mom already had a name picked out for her baby girl. And when Heather and I saw that, we looked at each other and said, oh, that's kind of a bummer. Because years ago, we had said, if, if God were to ever give us another girl, we would love to name her Mercy. And we know that's not the most common name. Heather and I looked at each other, though, and said, well, it's obviously not a deal breaker. So we read this profile about this birth mom and who she is and her desires for her child. When we got to the end of the profile, she said, I have a name already picked out for my daughter. I want her to be named Mercy. Believing this was not a coincidence, immediately tears began to flow, and Heather and I just prayed, God, we don't, we don't know if this is all going to go through, but we're trusting that you are leading in all this, however you will. So about a month later, for the first time, we met Mercy's birth mom via Zoom. And I think she may listen to this, but regardless, I want to say to all of you that Heather and I fell in love with this birth mom who was making a hard, brave, selfless, sacrificial decision to do what she believed was best for her beautiful baby girl. And we honor her. And we honor her trust in the Lord and her desire for mercy's good in this entire adoption process. There is no question, there will never be a question about how much mercy is loved by her birth mom. And we also honor her dad as an image bearer of God. Well, about a week later, Mercy was born. And here's a picture of Mercy happily being held in her first mom's arms. A couple of days later, we met them both. And this mom entrusted Heather and me to be a mom and dad to Mercy. And the reason I've not shared any of this publicly is because anyone who's been through an adoption process knows that a variety of complications can arise along the way. And you want to be wise and careful in honoring everybody involved to wait until things are final. And the last six months have involved a lot of ups and downs and emotions that I've alluded to at different points. Different points I've said, Lord willing, I'll be able to share with you about this one day. Well, all of that led to two weeks ago when Heather and I had the opportunity via Zoom to be in a courtroom to tell the story of God's clear love for this little girl, her birth mom's love for her, our love for her, specifically the story of her name. By the end, the judge said the courtroom was in tears as she pronounced that Mercy was a member of the Platt family. So here, here's one of my favorite pictures of Mercy. Uh, I have about 5,000 others on my phone if you'd like to see them as well. And, and just as a picture of the, the chaos in our family. So I was, uh, I was alone at the house one night this week. I was giving her a bottle and just singing over her before bed as she looked up peacefully at me. So that's, that's just her, like, peaceful... Mercy about to go to bed. When I hear the rest of the family walk in the house, they come barging into her room. They're kissing all over her and playing with her, which led to this picture. <laughs> when I look at her, she's like, just put me in the bed like I was about to go to bed. But even, even that picture is... Bittersweet. We are obviously so, so, so thankful for the journey that God has orchestrated in ways we never could have imagined and the baby girl he's entrusted to our care. At the same time, we have a son who's waiting for this story to play out for him, to be a part of that picture. His birthday is actually tomorrow. We had a call with him this week to wish him happy birthday, to introduce him to his new sister, 
And we got off the call and just prayed, especially amidst all that's going on in that part of the world. God, please open the door for us to go to him. You know, the, the bittersweetness for me actually goes one, one layer deeper because Tuesday, so two days from now, is the anniversary of the day when my dad suddenly died of a heart attack. And it, it makes me really sad that he never got to see this picture. None of my kids, actually. He, he never got to see me as a dad. All of them have only heard about him. But isn't that the beauty of Psalm 127? Because when the Lord builds the house, it is not in vain. It's not empty. It's not pointless. It lasts. My dad pointed me to the Lord in a way that I'm now pointing my kids to the Lord with everything in me. And for all who trust in him, one day we're going to be with the Lord together in a house that will last forever. That's a valuable, meaningful, peace-filled life that counts. And I want to exhort you to live it. Turn aside from all the ways this world would cause you to live in self-sufficiency and anxious toil and seeing children as burdens and barriers. Live your life in God dependency with beloved rest, building family as he leads in ways that bring him glory and you good. All that leads me in the end to our church family, to be in a church family that counts. So a month ago, I preached on a biblical response to the Dobbs decision that overturned Roe versus Wade. As we considered a culture where so many don't see the fruit of the womb as a reward. But we said that day, we need to consider all the ways God is calling us to work on behalf of children in the womb and when they're out of the womb and their moms and their dads. We need to act accordingly. We need to do justice and love mercy. So we took up an offering starting that Sunday, if you were here over the next couple of weeks, and you gave over and above your regular giving $160,000. And I want to share with you what we are going to do as a church family with this. In fact, I want to show you by inviting a group of people to join me up here. And there are, there are folks who are here at Tyson's and folks who are at our other locations today. And these folks on stage will represent some of the others that you'll hear about. But uh, standing up here is Kelly White, who is from Assist Pregnancy Center. So one of you, know, will you welcome Kelly? This is one of many pregnancy centers that we've had a close relationship with over many years, with a variety of members from Tyson's and Arlington specifically uh, volunteering there. She represents five specific pregnancy care centers that work with each of our locations, Mosaic and Loudoun, Rockville Women's Center and Shady Grove in MoCo, and Life First in PW, who have representatives at those locations today. In addition to CareNet, so Kristen from CareNet, would you welcome Kristen from CareNet? You remember uh, uh, Roland Warren, who shared a month ago when he was when we were walking through this, and he oversees CareNet. They together help support and uh, build up and uh, just strengthen pregnancy care centers all across, pregnancy resource centers all across our country. So. Out of your giving, we're going to give a donation to every one of these pregnancy care centers and to CareNet so that you all know on behalf of our church family, especially amidst all that's going on in our culture right now, that you are not alone, that we are with you, for you, and honored to partner alongside you. So we want to give you these gifts. There we go. Then going down the line, so Chris Seaton is here from Project Belong. Would you welcome Chris with me? Project Belong, like look this up. They connect with uh, churches with 
uh, children in foster care all across uh, the DMV, and specifically foster children who may be aging out of that system, and there's so much need for care in that process. And so likewise, Chris, we want to say we thank God for you, and we are with you, and so honored to partner alongside you in this work. This is like pure joy, just giving out checks. Um, Who's not up here, but I would mention Foster the Family that helps work with foster families. We're going to be giving to as well as Carry to Full Term. So this is a ministry that comes alongside vulnerable moms and their babies, specifically in the first couple of months, first two years of uh, those babies being born in order to help them in those critical time, in that critical time especially. So... In addition to giving to a total of 10 different ministries like these and partnerships across all our locations, we're also setting aside some of the money you have given to help support families in our church family who either want to foster or adopt, believe God's leading them to do that, and who face financial challenges in that process. Anybody who's been through those processes knows that there's unique financial challenges. So we have set up a way for anybody who is fostering or adopting within our church family to apply for support from our church family as they do that. Earlier in the 9 o'clock gathering, they weren't able to be here at 11, 2, but Brian and Tony uh, are a family that's been through the foster care and adoption class here, and they are just about to travel over to India to pick up uh, one, uh, to, to pick up uh, a child who, uh, just on the names story, uh, who's a child whose name means, they're going to keep first name, uh, that means full of happiness, and then the middle name they have uh, is joy. So full of happiness and joy is going to be here, a part of our church family in the days to come. But uh, they, they didn't know we were going to be uh, talking about how we're giving to help families do this. They thought they were just going to be prayed for, but we gave them a check. So uh, I, I want to encourage, as the Lord raises up, men and women, families, to foster and adopt. We as a church family want to help you in any way that we can. We have classes toward that end, and then when there is financial needs, a way, an outlet for you to potentially get support in that. So all of that is coming out of uh, what you gave. And then I want to uh, ask Eliza to share about a couple of new initiatives that we are starting with the funds that you gave. So Eliza directs our counseling as a church family. So Eliza, share with us what's going on. Yeah, good morning, church family. Uh, One of the things that we are seeking to do in connection with local outreach, uh, Lauren DeLuca has been an amazing part of this as well, but we are connecting with these ministries and we're actually trying to um, find volunteers right here in the church. So if you've listened today and and you've continued to hear like, what can we do? Now that we're on the other side of Roe v. Wade, this is a great opportunity because we're looking for people to just be supportive friends who can return phone calls of people inquiring about questions related to pregnancy decisions. We want the church to be the place that people go to find that supportive friends and for supportive friend, and we will connect them with the many resources that you see represented up here on the stage, and you'll be able to learn more about them in the lobby too. But so, if that is of interest to you, we want you to go to mcleanbible.org slash pregnancy support. There's a form at the bottom. You can fill it out and just share what you might be interested in. And we will connect with you for training and just ways that there is a need to serve. And this can be, if you are a church group, we need men and women, married or single, just somebody who is willing to be that supportive friend. So you can go to that website. But Also, that same website has on there many resources, many different opportunities for those who are finding themselves facing pregnancy decisions, much like the story we heard even this morning with David's family. So if if you or someone you know has found themselves in a place where they have some difficult decisions related to pregnancy, we want you to get help right here at NBC. We want to point you in the right direction. Use that same Uh, URL and that same form. And it's pretty self-explanatory when you go there, but we want you to be able to know that there are people here who want to walk with you and connect you to the support you need and help you get the answers you're looking for. So here's the deal. So pregnancy support, mcclainbible.org slash pregnancy support. I, I want to pray for all that's represented up here. But before I do, I just want to say to you as a church family, 
Right? This is God's grace in and through you. You have made this possible by not just clapping about a court decision and not just commenting on political discourse, but by stepping up and saying, we wanna show women and men and children, including children in the womb across our city that we honor them and we love them and we're gonna give and serve and do what we can to show that children are a reward, as are the moms who carry them. So may this just be the beginning in our lives and our families. May God give us quivers full of children as we see them not as burdens but as blessings. As a church, may we pour our lives out for the next generation. And may we do justice and love mercy on behalf of moms and dads and children with a variety of needs across our city so that they might know the love of the Lord who builds the house and the Lord who watches over the city. Will you bow your heads with me? God, we love your word. We need your word. We need your word to transform our minds and our hearts to live according to it. So I, I, I pray over every single person within the sound of my voice that you would help us to live the valuable, meaningful, peace-filled life that counts in dependence on you, with trust in you. You'd keep us from vain lives. And God, in our families, that you would build families across our church family in ways that show the reward that your word talks about here. God, we pray that you would deliver us from worldly ways of thinking to think according to your word. We pray that the next generation would be raised up, even across our church family, that knows who you are, what you've done, how you love, is ready to pass that on to the next generation after them. And God, we pray that not just for our church family, we pray across our city. We are so thankful for those who are standing on the stage right now and other locations who are doing work day in and day out to show your love in these ways. We pray for your blessing, your favor on them, your help for them, your strength for them. We pray that you bless our partnerships together for the good of others and the glory of your name. And God, we pray that our church would count to the full for the sake of children in the womb and out of the womb and moms and dads all across the city who are in need. God, we, we pray that you'd help us to humbly, having heard this word, to do it in all the ways you lead us in the days ahead. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.